also been hearing a lot about um, FHSA. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah. I'd love to. So this is a new plan for this year that the government's just started. It's a first home savings account. Mm. So again, the government was uh, hearing a lot about the concerns about property and prices and how am I going to get ahead. So they've developed a new vehicle, first home savings account. Um, should be open by the end of this year. Everybody will at least be able to put money in by the end of this year if you can get one open. If you want to learn how to start investing, this chat is for you. Welcome to Van City Chats, Episode 3. Today, we have Sophie Salcedo, a wealth advisor from Van City, joining us to talk about investment for beginners. Sophie, welcome. Would you like to share with the audience a bit about your background and what you do at Van City? Sure, I'd love to. So I have a long history with Van City. I've been a member since I was 16 years old, and I've been working here 25 years now. So it's been a long journey, and I actually came here after going through university and getting my business degree, and I was banking at Van City every week, saved my money, and I bought a condo when I was 25 years old. And I've been doing my own financial planning, and I thought, I think I need to go work at Van City. It always looked like a great place to work. So I did that, and I got into Van City. And I eventually have now become in the role that I'm at. I'm a wealth advisor at Van City, and I'm also a certified financial planner. So in simple terms, I help people decide how to manage their money to achieve their goals, and hopefully at the end of the road, have a really comfortable retirement. That's amazing. That's such a colorful background. And um, we're so excited to have you here. And we have so many, I have so many questions about investing because I myself is a beginner. So let's, let's get our questions started. Sophie, um, what, what is investing? So I think those simple questions are great because we need to get the basics under everybody's belt. So I'll give you two examples. A really simple one is actually a tomato plant. So I sometimes equate investing to gardening. People might go out and buy a tomato plant. I want to save some money. I want to grow my own tomatoes. You're going to care for the plant, water it, put it in the sun. You've paid $3 for this plant. You're going to hope to get a lot of tomatoes later. So you've invested in a plant to reap the crop of the tomatoes. And investing is the same. Someone may have money in a bank account just sitting there, not earning a lot. You start by investing by asking, how can I do better with this money? Can I buy what's called a term deposit and earn today maybe 4 or 5% and get this interest income? So I'm making money on my money. And to be honest, most of our viewers slash listeners have all been investing since they were very young. Why? Because their parents hopefully opened them a bank account and we're, something was happening with that money in the bank account. So ask those questions. Teach your children. We've actually had experience. We just might not know what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. That's so great. I love that analogy of the garden. Um, that really paints a good picture of about investing. Can we talk a bit more how to get more involved in investing? You mentioned that parents have a big role in teaching children, but if you're an adult right now yeah. with none of that with behind you with that education, what would you recommend on how to get started? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So there's so many avenues, right? We all have so many sources we can go to. The important thing is finding a, a good source, I would say. So there's certain books out there. People may want to read a book, go online, find a good source. I would say also just go to your financial institution if you're comfortable, you're able to walk in or call or book an appointment with someone trusted or certified, someone you might even know or have met in a branch location already, to just get some free advice and ask them, what do you think I should be doing here? What's possible with your institution that I could do? And then the next thing is always talk to a trusted family friend, mm -hmm. someone who you feel is doing well that you can trust and say, hey, how did you do this? What are you doing? Yeah, that's a great advice. I find... Um, you know, matching yourself with the right financial advisor is really important. Would you say that having a really good rapport is important? Yeah, it's it's extremely important. Um, finding the right person is really important. And I don't think a lot of people actually know or think of the fact that you can ask to work with someone new as well. So quite often people come into a branch or are suggested, okay, we're going to have you meet with John Doe. Here you go, go meet with this person. And you might not feel a good fit and you walk out not feeling comfortable to actually hand them your hard earned money and move forward. So you can always go back to who, who sent you that to that person and just say, you know what, I feel like I need another fit. Can you give me someone more like A, B, C, or D? Mm -hmm. And there's usually going to be somebody they can give you a second shot with to mm -hmm. try to find the fit. And don't stop till you find the fit. It's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. It's a great advice there. What is the easiest way to start investing? You mentioned books, um, listening to podcasts um, possibly, and finding someone in your network. Um, what else would you suggest? Yeah, so 
look at your bank account, see what savings you have. You sort of need to know what amount do I think I could safely tuck away without impacting my day-to-day -day spending, okay? And it, you don't need a lot of money these days. There are different vehicles where you can take $50 a month even and just start to invest it into something to try to get you ahead. And even the simple term deposit that I mentioned where you might earn today 4 or 5%, it's better than earning zero or it's sitting. So just seek out some op opportunities like that. That's great. Can you tell us a bit more about the different types of investments for a beginner? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to try to touch on five and try to make it short and sweet and simple. So let's start with five different ones. The term deposit that I mentioned already, very simple. Talk to your someone working at the bank or credit union where you're banking, put it into a different vehicle. It might earn you a bit more money. Then sometimes people will ask, what's a stock? So you can also invest your money in the stock market and buy a stock, which in simple terms mm -hmm. is just owning a portion of a company. So owning a share in a large company. That's another option. Uh, the third one I'll say is a bond. So you might hear bond in the news or people talk about a bond. This is something issued by a government or a company where, again, you're going to hand them your money. You're, we call it principal. You give them your money, they're going to agree to pay it back to you at a certain time frame and a certain amount of income or interest. So that's what a bond is. There's also a mutual fund. So a mutual fund is pooling investors together so that they're going to diversify all your money and spread it around a bunch of different companies. So if you only have $100, you can't buy a 1,000 companies, but this mutual fund will spread it all around for you because all the investors will come together. And you can buy into that monthly. Very simple. That's very common in Canada. And the last one you read or hear a lot about now are exchange traded funds. So this is similar to a mutual fund, but slightly different animal. And most people don't even know that it was started in Canada, to be honest with you, but it was. The first exchange traded fund was in Canada in the 90s. We called it TIPS, T-I-P-S, back in the day. Uh, who knew we were so brilliant, but we were. And so now it's a worldwide phenomenon, yeah. And um, so here you're, you're investing into an index. So a stock market, a market index, and you just mimic an index. Nothing active about it. It's all passive. The fees are usually quite lower, lower as well. So you want to seek advice on if that's a fit for you as well. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned all these five. And what, is, um, what would you recommend if someone is really risk adverse? Like what would be the first investment product would you suggest? Yeah, and I would say, I would put it this way, whether or not you're risky or not, it's really the knowledge level. Mm. You know, you might be quite, you might be able to sustain risk. You just haven't thought about it or had anyone talk to you about it, look at your situation. But pretty much all of us, I'm pretty sure, that are around me at the moment, probably bought a term deposit or had a bank account with money in it. So most people start there because that is the easiest slash least risky way to invest your money is in a term deposit with a fixed rate of return. Mm -hmm. You're the the firm that you're investing the money with, the credit union, the bank, they're guaranteeing the money. So you feel comfortable with that. The government will guarantee it too, because there's some credit union yeah. slash bank coverage. And that's the easiest way to start. But you need to get advice because you may or should likely expand past that. Mm -hmm. first no, round. I love that. I think that is what um, what I'm getting is that I do need a financial advisor just to kind yes, of... Yes, you do. <laughs> Go over all the options. Yeah, when, you know, you mentioned stocks, and I think uh, for myself, you know, and probably for many viewers, um, stock market, it can sound really intimidating. And do you know, like, can we maybe normalize it that this yeah. is a like, very common thing yeah. to invest for all people? Yeah, I think we definitely should start to do that. This is something that's been around for, I think I'm correct when I say about 200 years. Mm -hmm. So there's been a stock market in the States, in the US for 200 years. So this is not a new animal. People, it's the ups and downs to it because the stock market, there's risk to it, meaning I hand my money and I invest it into a stock. Even a so-called safe stock like a bank will go up and down depending on the market. But that's okay if you're a long-time investor. In fact, it's a good thing when it goes down, like right now, by the way, at the moment, to go and invest your money at that time when it's down. What do we all do? We buy our gas when we see it on sale, mm -hmm. right? Oh, the price is down. You tell your friends, go buy gas at the corner here. And we rush out to buy it when it's low. But we do the exact opposite with the stock market when our money's invested. It's so personal for us. And I understand that. But it's, it's education. It's talking to others to understand, oh, this is the cycle to it. Mm -hmm. How risky is it? Yes, it goes up and down, but they're going to pay me a dividend, some income. 
And I feel like my money will come back to me at the end of the day when I'm ready to sell it. Mm -hmm. so. so Sophie, should I pick my own stocks? That's a great question. And it really depends on each individual person. There's no right answer. I would say what's gone on these days is there's a lot of self-directed, self-managed accounts. And some people find the advice that they need very easily and they, they gravitate to it. They like it. They want to spend the time in watching the market, learning more, and they will invest their money. It can be a lower cost solution. So it's saving them a bit of money. So that's an online self-directed. Now we have robo-advisors as we call them, right? This is classic AI, big mm -hmm. topic right now, right? Yeah. So you're going to fill out a questionnaire, going to answer some questions about your time frame, goals, your risk levels, and AI will spit you out a wonderful portfolio that you will invest in. Mm -hmm. Now there won't be any deviation from it. So it's not that you can probably control what you buy or sell in there. You just are going to go into it and tuck it away. I've had clients come to me after doing that because they realize, you know, I'm, I'm not doing enough with the rest of my money. I don't have an overall picture what are, what are my goals? What should my goals be? What can I achieve? How can I achieve it? What plan, what type of investment should I have? So they come then to me and then now I am the full service advisor. And so now I'm going to be the person that you're going to call. You'll know you'll talk to me on the end of the phone line, right? Not a 1-800 number. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to look at your and make personalized solutions for you to try to get you to achieve the goals that you want. Mm -hmm. Do you find it um, easier to work with clients who bank with one bank versus various other institutions? Well, I'm going to be honest. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's all the information in one source for myself, right? Versus having to try to gather the statements. Have we missed anything? Mm -hmm. More often than not, there is something out there that we've missed, including in the plan, because I couldn't go into our system where I work and see right. everything that's there. That makes sense. Yeah. Not everybody adheres to that. People have various theories about why they don't want to do that. And that's fine too. But I will say it is a little easier for me and that's often why people want to bring things together too, especially as you get older, when you're dealing with your parents, let's say you're going to want your parents to have all their things in one place to help you too. So I do find it easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. How does, you know, when you start investing, how do you know if you're aligning with your own values? And I always find that it's, there's, you know, the part of investing, but there's also that emotion and values component Yeah, you look at long term. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely a big topic, um, especially right now. And uh, Van City did did start this whole concept of investing and alignment with your values. So Van City, our credit union, started the ethical funds back in the 80s and took a bunch of capital and seeded this investment that was going to screen out certain investments because they didn't want the money to be supporting, let's say, at the time, tobacco or munitions. And so it was aligning the money where it was invested with, with what the values were going to be around it. And I have to say it's very common today, especially the younger generation. Um, we can delve into that in a minute. But if you want to align with your values, you need to find an advisor who a, understands what that means, so can have a discussion with you, and then B, is agreeable to present you options like that. And Van City as a company and our group of advisors, we've definitely watched this whole area grow now, and we try to stay very top of mind with people and also stay on top of the best ways to move forward with a social screen, an environmental screen, what does that mean, mm -hmm. what goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But people can definitely look for those solutions now. Yeah, we talked about young investors and just younger generation. Um, curious to see what do you see the difference in between the younger generation and the older generation in terms of their investment knowledge or goals? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I find it very interesting to watch this over the years and see what 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 triggers people. What's what's what what are they into? What do they think about? So. Just starting with Gen X, uh, excuse me, Gen Z and Gen Y, our younger demographic, I'd say Gen Y was definitely that generation where socially responsible investing was just, it wasn't even an issue. It was like, of course I want that. Mm -hmm. I would say to them, this is available. Are you interested in this? And it was almost a, of course I am. Why wouldn't I be? This is our generation that grew up recycling. Mm -hmm. So they're just so attuned to it, which is great. So that also was how the pickup really started with socially responsible investing. They understood what that meant deep down. It was just a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And I feel Gen Y is going to look like it should be a very responsible generation. They're, they're probably going to carry that along. So that's really, really important to them. The younger generation is obviously much more adapt and able to go online, look at those different sources, which I think is good. All I want people to make sure is that it's a, it's a source worth watching. 
worth listening to and not going to take you down a wrong path. So you really need to vet those things as well. Uh, a little bit more time on that. I'd say the next generation is me. I'll admit it. I'm a Gen X, a Gen X generation. We um, we do feel quite comfortable with the stock market, a lot of my generation, because we grew up during the 90s. And the 90s was a very good decade for stocks. So in our background, we would hear stocks have done well. People are making a lot of money. Yeah. And so that was great. The younger generation sometimes are a little adverse to the stock market still because of growing up around 2008 when there was a very bad credit crisis and stocks were not good. Mm. And people could not retire. So it was a very tough time. Some people had to delay retirement. They heard those stories. So they have to deal with that. That might be in their background. And then let's end with the boomers, right? Uh, another very large demographic. Uh, one study I read in terms of social responsible investing in that demographic said about two thirds of them were not concerned at all about <laughs> social responsible investing. I had never no, heard about it. Surprise, actually. No, yeah. exactly. So <laughs> it's just the differences that go on mm -hmm. throughout generations of living and growing. And, and that generation is receiving a lot of inheritance money now, of course. They will be passing on inheritance money as well. So that generation is one of the largest amount of assets to invest. And it's just about learning about things. I find when we ask them about it or try to engage them and, and explain what's going on, they will, they're receptive. They're very receptive to it. It's just about uh, presenting them the option. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when we look at some of the statistics out there, there's like 70% of women don't have a financial advisor versus 41% men do. Yeah. Can you explain why there's such a big gap? Yeah, these um, stats are something I seem to be spending my life trying to change. I will continue to do so. I am a female myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, so these stats always, I, I'm not happy when I hear these stats. I, and I do wonder why and try to dig through and how can we change these things. Uh, part of it may be generational as well. So maybe women at a different era, different time sort of felt like, oh, well, I'm going to take on certain aspects within our my life or my partnership, and maybe I have a partner who will go do the money talk, manage those investments, et cetera. I think that should be changing. We have uh, over 50% of girls and women are now graduating from university. This is a good thing. Yeah. That means they should earn more. They should make more. There should be more money to now go and get and seek advice on. I think sometimes women feel like maybe they don't need it. They shouldn't ask. They don't have enough to go and ask about. And I just say, please go and ask for advice. Please help yourself get ahead. Um, you need to do that for yourself. And an important reason why is another statistic I'll throw back <laughs> is that 92% uh, of women will end up managing their money one day. Wow. That's why? A high percentage. Because we live longer, Anita. That's right. So you can put it off, but there will be a day and you don't want to have to do it at 80, 85 when potentially a spouse is gone and now it's come to you. Mm -hmm. And now... You either will step up and be able to do it, or you'll have to find someone to help you. Hope you have somebody around you to trust to do it. Mm -hmm. So don't put off the inevitable and don't just find a trusted person, someone safe for you to talk to. But I know for myself, I'm a quick story for where my mindset came from was actually I grew up in a, a household where my mother held down the nine to five job, worked all the time, thus budgeted. My father was not great with money wow. and had a job that was up and down. So that's how I grew up. That's what I saw. I'm not doing anything different than what I saw. It was only when I sort of got older and looked around and realized, oh, that's not what's happening everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I thought, okay, I guess this is, has been different. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's just intuitive and natural that women should be doing as much as they can to get ahead for mm -hmm. themselves too and getting that advice. We're important. That's great. Yeah, the 92%. Wow, I didn't didn't realize that. It's just it's another the... way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, you know, we're all working. How much of income around approximately should we be investing? Yeah, that's if it's a... by month or yearly, what's your advice? Yeah, that's a big a big topic. Uh, I, you might hear me say it depends a lot today. Yeah. <laughs> On some level it does. There was a popular investment book though that came out of Canada called The Wealthy Barber. Oh, a lot I of heard us about that. Yeah, yes. a lot of us of a certain generation I'm yeah. sure read it. And he advocated saving 10% of what your income is and also sort of taking it away from yourself right away. So it comes into your bank as a payroll deposit and you want to immediately have some vehicle set up to let's say take that $50 or $100, 10% a month and do something else with it for your future. Mm -hmm. Invest it for your future, whatever it's a property, retirement and take it away right away. And most of my clients will come back and tell me, you know what, Sophie, I've been doing that and I actually am managing. And we do. We are very adaptable human beings and flexible. If you have a little bit less each month, 
we sort of figure out, okay, I can't have as many coffees as I want. I have to make it. And I do advocate living it that way with a little bit of tightness. If you have goals you want to achieve, you, you've got to make that goal a priority. Mm -hmm. That's great. 10% of your monthly income. 10%. I would look at everybody's situation to see what is your rent, what is your down payment. If you're living at home and paying a menial rent, you should be saving more. Mm -hmm. If you've got a full family, someone's not working in the household as one income, of course, you may not be able to at that time. Okay. So you've really got to look at your situation and get, and get advice or think for yourself, what, what can I do here? That's great. So Sophie, what does it mean when someone tells me you need to diversify your portfolio? <laughs> yeah. That's another one of the jargon, another one of the words that we learn. What does that mean? And so you you probably also hear we we're talking about eggs when we say diversify, right? So you're carrying Talk about tomatoes now, eggs. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of food today. So it's eggs, right? Yes. If you have a dozen eggs and you've even just imagine putting them individually in a basket and you're going on a walk down the road, if you fall just because you slip, something happens to you, you didn't plan on it. You're out of luck. All all the eggs are gone. Mm -hmm. When we talk about diversity, we mean take each egg, take your asset, take your money, your income, and put it into different baskets mm -hmm. to hold them so that if something bad happens for one basket, you've got the other one still to, to fall back on. So have some money in cash and emergency money. Have some money in the stock market if you've got the time frame. Try to buy a property and have money in a fixed asset like that. And so that's what we mean by diversifying. Okay. So Sophie, that was so helpful. So how does that translate for the ultimate beginner of an investor? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to use my own personal self as, as a story around that. So myself, I had term deposits, like I mentioned, in the credit union. I was saving and sometimes I would invest them for a year and earn some interest. And then eventually I earned a bit more money. My income got higher and I was saving a bit more and had extra. So my next step then was to actually seek out a mutual fund, which I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and start to invest a little bit more into a mutual fund. So now I've diversified myself from just the cash mm -hmm. to a mutual fund to try to earn more. And I think that's a very natural progression for people is as your income goes up or you receive an inheritance, you're receiving more money, you will now be able to go past just the term deposit in the bank to the mutual fund, the stock later, an advisor later, buying a property later. It's gradual. Oh, that really makes sense for someone like me, um, especially if I'm just totally new. So that's very practical. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So we hear a lot about, I hear a lot about opening up a TFSA. Can you explain a bit about that? Sure. So TFSA, the tax-free savings account, they're an excellent vehicle that started in Canada in 2009. So every Canadian, if you were of 18 years of age at that time, has a room for $88,000 to tax shelter money in a tax shelter plan where you won't owe any tax as the money grows. So it's a great, I call it like a golden golden egg. It's a, it's a great vehicle. So you can grow some money tax-free. You can put money in. You can take money back out when you need it and not pay tax. You can replace the money you took out later. Oh. The government will track what you took out and you can, and they'll carry it forward forever. So you can put it back in, which is great. And although it says savings account, we want to reiterate it's, a, it's actually an investment vehicle. So a lot of clients have had to learn, don't just leave it in the bank if you don't need it. Take it and actually invest in the stock, bond, mutual fund, try to grow that money. Um, some, some people have hundreds of thousands of dollars in that account now because they were investing it to grow it since, since inception. And the last thing I'll, I'll note to this vehicle is it's actually an estate tool mm -hmm. for a lot of my clients I work with, because if you're fortunate and you're older and you no, you might not even need to touch that money, but you'll be able to pass it right away to your beneficiary, which could be your children mm -hmm. later. That's so great. And that's something I actually didn't even think beyond that about the long-term yeah. passing it down. Also been hearing a lot about um, FHSA. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah. I'd love to. So this is a new plan for this year that the government's just started. It's a first home savings account. Mm. So again, the government was uh, hearing a lot about the concerns about property and prices and how am I going to get ahead. So they've developed a new vehicle, first home savings account. Um, should be open by the end of this year. Everybody will at least be able to put money in by the end of this year if you can get one open. And they're going to allow you to tax shelter $8,000 per year, up to a maximum of $40,000. Uh, and each year you'll be given another $8,000 of room. And again, you can invest it. You can put it into cash just to tuck it away before you may want to buy a property with it. 
There'll be no tax. It can grow as much as it grows. You take it out and you put it towards a property. can only be open 15 years, okay. but the government has um, been, I think, made a very wise decision and actually is allowing people, if you don't buy anything in 15 years, you now can move it into an RSP vehicle a registered savings plan, and you won't need the room for it mm -hmm. so that you'll still keep your assets. And the other big important factor is money you put into an FHSA is similar to an RRSP in that you actually get a tax deduction on it too. So you'll get some taxes back from that okay. deposit too. And those are strictly more suitable for those who are looking at buying their first home. It's, it's, you, it's set up and the goal should be for people to buy a home with it. Mm -hmm. But I would say people are going to be thinking creatively about this vehicle as well. Mm -hmm. And okay. so it's going to be needing some advice. People should be coming in for advice mm -hmm. to see, is this vehicle of use for me or not? Mm -hmm. If you own a home and you've already bought a property, likely not. Mm -hmm. But it's not nothing based on age. You need to look at your situation. Right. Yeah. You know, I also see a lot of, um, you know, discussions about RSP, TFSA. They're like, you know, pros and cons, what now? Could yeah. you simplify that if someone were to decide either? Yeah, that's a, a lot of articles I see about that as well, Anita. Mm -hmm. And so there's some some sort of simple rules I'll give you that you can think about. If it's between a tax-free savings account and an RRSP, what we quite often would say is if you're someone younger or in a lower income bracket, and you expect your income to go up over time with work maybe, you can start with the tax-free savings account. So it's probably a better vehicle if you're in a lower income bracket. You won't be taxed on it when it comes out later. And you and we might want to save your RSP room for later when your income is higher and use RSPs at that point in time. So that's sort of a rule of thumb to use there. Mm -hmm. Some people have no more RRSP room. So some people have a pension plan and they don't actually have a lot of leftover RSP room. So then they're going to go to the tax-free savings account. Now we're going to have this third vehicle. So we're going to have this first home savings account and we're going to be analyzing how is this going to fit into the situation. Likely also for somebody where we want a tax deduction of, off of some income taxes as well, potentially. Um, but we're going to have to have some more thoughts and advice around that plan, which will probably be coming out more next year as we're all analyzing it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Something to look more into for myself personally. Yeah, yeah for sure. Can you explain what a mutual fund is for a, a beginner investor? Yeah, definitely. So a mutual fund is very popular in Canada, and it's it's a pooling of investors. So it's a fund where there's many dollars coming from many investors all pooled into one fund that would have a fund manager, and this team would be deciding which stocks from which countries are we holding into this fund. And the funds can grow very, very large. But that vehicle thus allows the beginner to take $50 a month, whatever it's going to be, and That's actually wow. buy and invest into that mutual fund once a month with their $50, which is so critical when you're starting out. I started out with a mutual fund too. Mm -hmm. You can't buy a Royal Bank share when it's priced at $100. You need to go into a vehicle which allows you to, to invest in a smaller format to start. That's so really it's a great way for a beginner to start to figure out how much can I save automatically off of my paycheck and just set up this automated buy into a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. So Sophie, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one asking here, what does it mean when it's tax-free, like a tax-free savings account? Yeah. So let's touch on that. It's a great question. So in a tax-free savings account, you can take your money and do an investment and invest to grow the money. So let's say you put in $2,000 and you go into a mutual fund and you let it sit for five years. It's You put in $2,000, it's $5,000 now. So it's grown in there. The government will let you just take that $5,000 out for whatever purpose you want mm -hmm. and use it without paying tax. Now that's a very special thing because if you did it in a non-tax sheltered format and invested in a mutual fund in a account that is not tax sheltered, you're going to owe the government taxes. Mm -hmm. There's there's no free party here. Mm -hmm. So you've made $3,000. The government is going to want you to record that on your taxes and you will owe a little bit of, let's they're called capital gains tax. There'll be dividend income tax and it, there might be interest income if there was bonds. And interest income is what we pay on our term deposits. Mm -hmm. Those are the safe vehicles and you pay the most tax on them. So if you make 4% on a term deposit, you don't unfortunately keep all of that interest if it's not tax sheltered. And sometimes the government's taking 30% back, 40%, depends what you're earning. Okay. So it sounds like TFSA is a really good um, tool, it's like a good investment tool. It's an excellent yeah. bang Absolutely. for your buck. Yeah. yeah. 
So Sophie, for our listeners and viewers out there, and we want them to get excited and they're new to investing, how do we get them excited about starting? Yes, I think this is exactly what we need to get people to do because I know it's a little bit of work. I know it might be an hour if you're seeking advice to go in and sit with somebody to get some help. But I want to say, jump over that hurdle and take that hour because what could happen is this. You're going to go in, find a bit of money that you feel like you could invest. Maybe it's $500. I don't know what it is. Save up for it. Save up a thousand. I've done it for my daughter, to be perfectly honest. She's only 15. It's going to start growing, hopefully. But take that money and say, I want to do something and grow this money for myself, for the property I want to own. And go out there and get some advice from us or somebody else, go into a mutual fund and let it just sit and be patient because there are times where it won't do too much and it's just going to sit there. But boy, oh boy, when the good years come and they will, you're going to watch that money grow and see it go up on your statements and it's going to feel like a lot of fun and you're going to have a benefit at that point. And so just just try that and experiment with it for yourself to learn about it Mm -hmm. with an amount of money that's reasonable for you if you can. Sounds like really good endorphins. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Thank you, Sophie. That's great. <laughs> Sophie, can you tell us a bit more about socially responsible investing? I feel like that's kind of a new term for a lot of us, for myself. And what does that mean for Van City? Yeah, for sure. So Van City started the first ethical fund that followed some socially responsible investing principles back in the 80s. So we have a, a long history with this type of investment. And we're also, of course, so proud to see that it is becoming and growing and growing and people really taking to this whole concept of aligning your values Mm -hmm. with your invested money, with the money you've worked hard to earn to feel like I'm putting my hard-earned money now into a vehicle or with management team that's going to pick companies that I want to feel proud about or know that they're doing good things for the environment. Um, We have fossil fuel free option as well. So we like to promote that too. So looking for the renewable stocks that might be the ones for down the road. So the big thing that people need to also understand within our Van City team, when we manage investments for people, you give us your hard-earned dollars, we're investing with, with some principles around it. We take all of those dollars and it allows us to also work with the companies to push for positive change from within. So we're able to file a resolution with the company as a shareholder to say, we'd like you to answer this question. Can you use this environmental procedure, which we think is better? Tell us more about why you're not or why you are using it. Is um, there gender pay parity within your company? If not, let's talk about this. So we're trying to push for positive change using your money that you've given us to do that. So there's a really great there's a really great energy that goes on around that. We've made some great changes over the years because of that. And now, of course, we look out and we see so many different companies who also now have adapted this and are running socially responsible investments. So it's really growing. And I think it's just good for for the people and the planet and all of us. I mean, at Van City, we've often talked about people, planet, and profit, mm-hmm. right? And I think this is a really, it's a great topic just for you to think about a little bit. Okay, we all want to have profit in our life and our money and everything. We want to get ahead and do well. Of course we do. But guess what? If we don't have a planet or people on a planet mm-hmm. because we haven't taken care of everything, we're not going to have profit anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, well, yeah. you know, just think about that a little bit and see maybe how we can all do those little small steps that help us, all of us. Mm-hmm. I want people to feel empowered, to seek knowledge, to find people they're comfortable with. I, I want people to understand it's very simple what I'm going to say, but it's so true. You are either going to control your money or your money will control you. Okay. So take action so that you can take control for yourself. It will really help you down the road. Well, Sophie, now that you've offered so much great advice for first time investors, what is the one takeaway or action that someone can do right now today? Yes. So let's build on what we've talked about today, Anita. So I really want people to go out there Get onto vancity.com and maybe find it a time where you can come in, talk to somebody. There's no cost. I always say whenever I meet with anybody, they walk away with some piece of advice. You're going to learn something and try to put aside some money that you could invest and talk to us about. Just try to change your daily habits maybe to build that little nest egg and get out there and take the next step. That's great advice. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sophie. Thank you.